I know. Uh, we'll go on the uh, Fine East, eh? Fine East. Hang on, Ray. David Barnes's responsibilities as Westport's harbour master cover vessels small and large. The uh, cement ships, um, they are very big vessels for the size of the harbour and we're trying to load them as deeply as we possibly can um, and still get them across the bar. So we have a very large um, value hydrographic package which we use to sound the bar but before the vessels come in um, I will go to the tip head and look at the situation on the bar and um, <clears throat> the master will look at what he sees from his side and we'll discuss the conditions and uh, the route that the master's going to take in. We'll check the tide to see that we've got sufficient under keel clearance and uh, that there is no set or um, anything else that's going to push the vessel off course and that's the procedure that we, we adopt. The Westport entrance, seen on a sunny day from the bridge of a large vessel, looks rather different from the view that a small fishing boat gets when the weather's starting to turn nasty. But the basic problems facing any vessel entering or leaving a bar harbour are caused by the same things. Each bar is different, but each bar is caused by littoral sand drift coming across the entrance and the harbour like uh, Westport has breakwaters designed to focus the river flow to try and cut a channel through that sand. Westport and Greymouth's bars are the product of the coast's famous rainfalls causing erosion on the west facing slopes of the Southern Alps. Short but often sensationally fast-flowing rivers like the Haast, the Arahura and the Taramako carry debris from high up in the Alps out to sea. Assisted by the scourings of the Fox and Franz Josef glaciers. The prevailing ocean current sweeps the shingle away from the river mouths up the coast, finally pushing it around the northern tip of the South Island, constantly enlarging Farewell Spit. In some conditions, off the mouth of the Grey River, the material settles for a while, forming a single submerged bar, usually fairly close in, before the current moves the excess material further north. At the mouth of the Buller River, the coast has turned east, and it's protected by Cape Foulwind. Here, in a kind of back end. But there is a national code of practice for bar crossings. This provides clear guidelines regarding safe and prudent practice when attempting to cross any bar or river entrance. It gathers the accumulated wisdom of all parties involved and its provisions boil down to one very simple idea. That every crossing should be treated with the utmost respect for what the sea can do. Like pick up many tons of boat and fish and play with it. Yeah, what Look a beauty! But to make things even more complicated, there's the fact that bar harbours differ from each other because of the shape of the coastline around them and the characteristics of the river feeding them. The Buller River has the largest catchment area in New Zealand and the Buller River is the largest flood volume river in New Zealand. If there is uh, any movement in the river, then that too will add to the conditions on the bar, uh, particularly on the outgoing tide, and uh, as much as an hour and a half before high water, the river will overcome any tidal influence, and you uh, have the waves standing up very short uh, and steeply against the incoming swells, and it makes it very dangerous indeed. If there is a swell, it depends on the length of the swell. Uh, the longer the period of swell, that's the, the amount of time between the swells, the greater they will refract into Buller Bay. Then they come over the sandbars 
put a high pressure water up on the beach and that uh, high pressure water will then come sideways and of course it goes straight across the entrance. But as the uh, swells come across the sandbars, they break, then they sweep up the beach and each bit of breaking air entraps more and more air in the water and then of course that um, air comes down the beach and across the entrance of the harbour. And uh, at that point of time, um, the stability of boats are severely inf affected, uh, insidiously because not a lot of people realise uh, the effect of the air in the water. But I mean, um, it's a, a well-known stability fact that boats are designed to float in water, not in air. So, right in the entrance, the possibility of short, steep pressure waves and air bubbles that make your vessel behave in ways you might not expect. And don't forget further out, the bars themselves. They can shift position in just a few days. Shifts six days worth of difference. Here we are uh, on the 19th of October with the sand almost across the entrance. Six days later, where we had 2.4 metres of water, we've now got 4.4 metres of water. And the river's just scooped the sand out, but it's moved it up here, and then we've dredged a channel through. Put it all together, and what have you got? Well, the detail may be complicated, but the message is simple. From wherever the bars are shifting around under the surface, right into the tip heads themselves, can be the most dangerous, treacherous stretches of water you're ever likely to have to sail in your whole career. It may be as much as a thousand meters or as little as 200. But when you're entering into a bar harbor, you and your vessel are at the most hazardous part of your voyage. Carrier back to Bob Gary, land clear Dave, go ahead. Yep, we're just sitting outside, we've got uh, a good metre and a half swell, um, 20 knots of wind on the beach, and just a slight easterly set, nothing that should bother you. Yeah, okay Dave, that doesn't sound too bad, we'll uh, line up and we'll give you a call. Just keep an to the uh, west of the way. That's right, we'll sit on your starboard side coming in, uh, just uh, watch that side of it. Okay, I'll give you a call and we'll line up. Roger. Each crossing of the multi-million dollar cement carriers and of other large vessels or barges is conducted with close cooperation between the captain and the harbour master. Three and a half cables. One, six, seven, two, six, four, five metres. Inshore fishing vessels can't afford this kind of thing. But most, if not all, of the updated information gathered for the large vessels is freely available. Today, many boats regularly use a fax machine for the latest weather maps. Why not for bar charts too? 1.8 meters. And tomorrow, if some recent developments are put in place, it's possible that an onboard computer could give you direct access via the internet to the latest bar charts. And to absolutely up-to-the-minute data on river flow and velocity, swell height, 
duration and direction. The state of the tide, wind speed and direction and perhaps to more sophisticated chart datum data. All of which may sound like science fiction but there are other things that you can deal with right now. For example, while it'll be good for you as a skipper to know what the water's doing in greater detail than ever before, that won't change what the water does to your boat. Inherent um, stability is derives from the buoyancy of the boat, and that's one factor, and that's a large quantity, against the weight and the weight distribution in the boat. And stability arises from the difference between those two quantities. And it's rather like a profit and loss account in a farmer, um, in that they're both very large quantities, but the differences can be small. And if you change the distribution of buoyancy, then you can be in a, in a loss situation. And if you change the distribution of weight, you can be in a loss situation very quickly. John Harry is a naval architect with long-standing connections with the fishing industry. He sees things from a boat designer's point of view. When you're crossing a bar, it's one of the few occasions when you're going in short-crested, steep waves. And in my mind, there are two different types of problem. One is when the wave is coming directly behind the boat and it catches the boat and the wave passes through the boat but as it does so the wave at the top is actually traveling faster than the wave ahead of it in the trough and that tends to drive the boat upwards and the, the bows will actually tend to plunge and it's quite easy to lose your windscreens on the front of the wheelhouse and get water in that way or when the boat has stalled, the wave can actually overtake and come crashing over the stern and actually bury it. Very sudden and dramatic, and if the boat is not very structurally seaworthy, a lot of damage can be done, and I've experienced it myself. Another way in which a boat can be lost on the bar is by broaching. Inherently, a boat will try and sit level on the water. But if it's actually on a sloping wave, um, parallel to the wave, it'll actually try and sit like that. There is nothing that the buoyancy distribution will do to try and correct that. It's naturally like that. In other words, it will take up the same slope as the wave, and there'll be no writing moment or buoyant moment trying to bring it back up. It'll naturally take this position up. But because the wave is coming in and rolls the boat quite quickly, there is a momentum effect. And as the roll captures the boat and there's nothing to restrain it, the energy imparted to the vessel by the wave will tend to drive the boat over and the momentum will take it right over. Older and smaller boats don't have the heavy gantries and the net rollers mounted high that more modern and converted vessels have. The higher the weight distribution on a boat, the greater the momentum effect. And of course, no skipper deliberately travels parallel to big waves. What tends to happen is that the wave will come from behind, the wave is travelling quickly past the boat, and the rudder, which isn't actually on this model at the moment, will be actually in water that's travelling with the boat and you lose steerage because there's no flow of water over the rudder. If there is a loss of control, and it's probable that you can get a loss of control in this situation, what tends to happen is the boat takes up an angle to the direction of the wave, and then because the wave is travelling faster at the transom than it is the bow, the boat will actually start to roll. If the side doors are open, or the windows are weak and sliding, then the superstructure will flood. If the hatches are open on the deck, they will permit flooding and water will come tumbling on board. 
and it doesn't take very much water to hold the boat in that attitude. Perhaps two cubic meters trapped in the hold or two cubic meters trapped in the wheelhouse will keep that boat over until the next wave takes the boat right over. So, just how much is two cubic meters? Well, take a dolav and first find out how much it weighs. Empty. Give or take 50 kilograms. A dolav's volume is something over half a cubic meter. Right, bring on the water. Six hundred and thirty five kilograms minus fifty means that a dolav holds well over half a ton of water. Here's the arithmetic. Two cubic meters weighs well over two tons, and that means that four dolavs worth of water is all it takes to hold your vessel over, waiting for the next wave. If nothing else, that means you should put lids on any empty dolavs on deck or turn them upside down before crossing the bar. And that, to my mind, leads to the important points that survival is one of preparation. Your boat has got to be watertight. The more watertight it is, the more likely you are going to survive such an incident. The whole deck has to be watertight. It's better if your wheelhouse can be watertight as well, as well, but that is expense. The door should be on the center line at the back of the wheelhouse. You should move away from having side doors because they're the first things we'll take um, up water when we're rolling. We should have freeing ports around the bulwarks of the boat to ensure that if water does come on board, it can be freed very quickly, in, in less than a minute. So preparation in terms of the water tightness can be done in port well before you go to sea. But I think there's also preparation in attitude. That is, you've got to realize when you're coming in, you're likely to be deeper in the water. You're moving more sluggishly. You may be tired and making maybe irrational decisions and the more prepared your boat is it'll be more forgiving if you make decisional uh, mistakes at that point because rolling and capsizing is a very sudden event and people do not have time to get on a life jacket they don't have time to get to a radio it is over in a few seconds and if you are not prepared you're going to be a casualty it means that your ship husbandry has got to be first class. It means that your watertight boundaries, your deck and your wheelhouse have got to be as watertight as possible because they're your life belt. They're the thing that's going to keep you alive, if not wet. They'll keep you alive. So, recognizing what the water on the bar is actually doing and understanding how your boat is likely to react to that are two very important foundations for preparing to cross the bar safely. On an unusually calm day like this, it's highly unlikely there's going to be a problem. But even so, a good skipper is going to keep up those habits of good ship husbandry or good seamanship that John Harry just talked about. Ensuring the watertight boundaries of his vessel and taking sensible precautions against getting any nasty surprises, especially from things that might come loose. Some of the basics are really simple. Make sure that all your freeing ports are clear of obstruction. And if it hasn't been done already, take the scupper pins out.
close all doors and hatches and make sure they are firmly secured. Some vessels have below decks and engine room ventilation ports that must be dealt with as well. Wind on loose chains and wires or stow and secure them. Wind on and lash all nets. Secure all loose deck gear and make sure that your poles and outriggers are all properly braced up. And make sure that somebody is looking out for that rogue wave that can sometimes come out of absolutely nowhere. That's the short version appropriate for a calm day like this. The skippers you've seen in this video have all survived some dodgy crossings in their time. To them, this one is better than the proverbial doddle. But they didn't survive those dodgy crossings without learning something from the experience. So once again, let the been there, done that skippers tell you in their own words what some of the basics are and take you through some of the more subtle aspects of getting them right. Anything that can move, tie down. Anything that can't move, tie it down. And anything else, tie that down as well, basically. Virtually, if it can move, you know, lash it down. It's just really straightforward. I mean, we've all been taught at school, you know. We're looking at a uh, quite a heavy anchor here. We're looking at... Um, Oh, probably roughly 60 kilo anchor, securely lashed to the side of the vessel. Once again, onto here, it's got, a fa it's got a fastening through it. That's what I call a securely lashed anchor. One of these things that broke a lashing on a bar would be dangerous to life and limb. This, this, this would be like a missile flying around the deck and breakers. And one thing you wouldn't want to do is your crew tell them to come up and start lashing this down when they're coming across the bar. Too late. With your pin in here, which is a good idea, with, you remove that pin, then your anchor's ready to set. Once again, it's got it moused as well, the shackle's been moused. Um, and even if you uh, like to go back along the chain, they've even put another safety rope on there in case someone inadvertently moves the controls, the anchor could set itself. So simple things like that um, can really be an advantage. And I said the vessel doesn't just roll over, it actually gets physically picked up and thrown on its side and uh, like a bit of string that might hold a, hold a dough lab in port when that dough lab's full of water and the boat gets virtually thrown on its side it needs a bit more than string, it actually needs a secure rope or you know, it, 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 three or four bindings it really needs to be secured you know, pond board's a bit like you, you know, when you put the ice cubes in the freezer you sort of uh, They'll divide them up. You, if you actually take, you put fill it up full of water and take that, uh, take the ice cube petition out. You can bloody hardly hang on to the bloody thing. You put that in, and it's just stiff as. And pond boards do the same thing on a fishing vessel. <laughs> so all this is full of fish, and when the boat rolls and I mean thrown on its side, the fish will not slide across. But if you've got things in the wrong place and say the fish aren't stored and them alone, you'd only need an empty pond between them or something and a boat rolls over and the fish can fall out into the next pond and things like that. You know, your fish has got to be locked so it can't go anywhere. The worst freezer you can probably have is a half full freezer. All right if it's ponded, but a half full freezer is still dangerous because when, when the boat rolls, I'm afraid all the fish, and if it's not contained, will end up on one side of the vessel. And in a freezer like this, which is holding, say, 18 tonne, straight away you're going to have nine tonne pressed up against the side, and it can be a recipe for disaster. Quite heavy duty lugs on here, which is good to see. I ensure that we've got everything lashed down, all hatch covers, if something can fill up with water, put a lid on it, um, tie everything down, close all ventilation, 
uh, for the engine room and stuff if, if it's in a spot where it can get water down it. And that is what I call a secure hatch. Watertight, water can come right across here and no water is going to get down into that hold. Just making sure all your scuppers are, uh, haven't got pins in them so that if you do cop a wave the water gets sh shaken off the deck. And basic safety measures, uh, have your life jackets ready. Talk, talk to your crew, you sort of let them know what, what's happening. Life jackets on the table. Making sure that everybody knows what you're going to do if there is a problem. And that um, things like life jackets and that are close to hand. Those are the uh, preparations that we make. Have one of your crew wave spotting because you can't be looking forward and looking back at the same time. If it's a real bad crossing, you have your crewman inside the door with the door shut and he's looking out either the window or the glass on the door for us. You've got to make sure that your day tanks are full. And the um, majority of the boats are only uh, sucking out of uh, engine room tanks. Yeah, I think it probably pays to make sure that both tanks are open. So if you do roll over, at least uh, you're not going to get a gutsful of air out of one tank. You make sure your fuel tank's got enough fuel in, and if you got hit by a decent swell, that if she went on a side, she wouldn't get an air block. A fuel blockage, and it's right when you come in and the boat does a big heave and a lurch, it's that sort of stuff that stirs up the muck in your fuel. And you make sure your engine room's uh, everything's tied down, for example, your uh, toolbox and that, and your fire extinguishers can't fly around. It has been known for a fire extinguisher to get fired off the wall, and hit a pipe in the engine room on a, on a vessel here once and break it. And by the time the guys got to the wharf, their bilge alarms were going. Most boats and motors these days have got automatic shutdown systems on them. Uh, low oil pressure, um, overheating, low water temperature, the motor automatically shuts down. I always override that system uh, when I'm going across the bars. The, uh, it'll probably horrify the manufacturers of the engines, but I think you're better off having a half-cooked motor tied up beside a wharf than having the uh, motor stop halfway across the bar and we end up on the beach or on the bricks. Um, check the engine room out, fuel tanks, stability, water in the bilges, just general seamanship really. It's just everything has to be perfect at that point. That's just when you don't want things to go wrong and that's when enormous sort of pressures are put on your boat that aren't normally, you know, the rudder gears all getting worked extra hard. The, ink, the propeller, everything, you know. Um, and yeah, just, just be aware of what can happen. Uh, you know, you've got crew on board, it's a, a lot's riding on, you're not getting it wrong, and you're a long time dead if you do. So those are some of the things that you can and should do to try to make every crossing as safe as this one. But worryingly, as we've said before, the record shows that many incidents happen to experienced skippers. That means that even if you do get everything right, you can still go down. Or it means that for some reason, skippers don't always take the proper precautions. The final part of the video looks at the pressures on skippers at decision time.